My name is Nico Steves. Podcasts this summer season will run 15 minutes each in a re-release of my first book, The Constant Procession, the history of the Virgin Mary since she passed on. I'd like to thank you for spreading the word about my new book, The Very Fine Light, which is available in the ebook format on Amazon.com. For the next couple of months, I'll be finishing up the audiobook version and also releasing a version in the printed form. This summer, I'll also be traveling to complete research for my next book, and I will be bringing you a few reports from the field about this upcoming book as research and interviews reach fruition. And so, please keep checking my website, nicosteves.com, as I will be posting blog updates from time to time during my summer research adventure. By the way, keep me posted on what you're up to in the comments section of my website or via email at nicosteves at gmail.com. And now, enjoy this installment of The Constant Procession. Installment 10 Chapter 18, Lady of Lourdes. This next appearance by the Madonna seems to have come as a counterpoint to this world of man-made wonder. It is 1858, a garbage dump in France. This is where she chose to apparate. Her desire? To have a chapel built there to help people. After the Madonna visited, this former refuse dump became a major Christian site where people came to heal. Today, the area surrounding the site is populated with various medical facilities and by some estimates, the former garbage dump sees well over a million people each year. The reality of the events which took place here in the modest backwater village is attested to every day, every time someone comes to the site. Tucked under the foundation of the huge basilica sits the modest grotto where she came and yes, today the spot is host to an endless stream of visitors. Here too, as at Guadalupe, you will find a continual glow of candles with prayers for intercessions from the people to the Madonna, hour after hour, day after day, as people come for guidance, help, or to give thanks. To those of little or no faith, it is a puzzle, yet it happens, though perhaps difficult for the logical mind to comprehend. Nevertheless, it is clear that many people believe this is a special place to come for spiritual strength through prayers to the Madonna, prayers seeking her to intercede. They believe that here they can take comfort in their faith, in the belief that the Madonna relays their prayers to God, the Son of Man. To quote Michael H. Brown, she tried to give an increasingly rationalistic world a taste of the right kind of supernatural and from Fons Verfel's book, The Song of Bernadette. Bernadette Savoyon at the time is 14 years old. Her family is very poor, living in the abandoned village jailhouse. Her father, once a proud owner of a sawmill, had been down on his luck for a very long time. Bernadette is an asthmatic and not considered very intelligent by her teachers. Bernadette struggled with her religious studies, and though older than her sister, She played with her sister and her sister's friends, sent on a task to gather firewood with her younger sister Maria and friend Jean. She falls behind their pace, which is no surprise, because as everyone knew, Bernadette seemed to be slow and dim-witted. Marie and Jean rush ahead, crossing a stream, as Bernadette stops and begins to remove her socks and wooden sandals before crossing. She is in a grotto, a small garbage dump, when she first encounters a lady. In her first encounter, Bernadette notices a wild rose bush at the edge of the cavern. It is shaking, although there is no wind. Words were not spoken as Bernadette gazes into the small grotto where this woman of indefinable beauty is. She is perched at the edge of the rock outcrop, barefoot, not standing on the stones, but just above them. When her sister and friend return, They find Bernadette in a rigid kneeling position. She is immobilized, gazing upward, and does not respond to their exhortations to get her attention. Frightened that she has fallen ill, the friend throws stones across the water at her, finally getting her attention. Jean shouts, 
Have you gone crazy praying here where the hogs root? Bernadette becomes herself again. That is none of your business. That's my own. Goodness, how you scared me, Bernadette, Marie, her sister, complains. I began to think your asthma had killed you. As she stands there, the nausea of astonishment at the strangeness of the world now yields to an intrepid feeling of a convalescent who has the sensation of being newborn. She picks up her wooden shoes and wades through the icy water of a February day, stopping midstream where the water reaches her knees. What cheats you two are? This brook is as warm as dishwater. Angrily, Marie shakes her head. Jean is right. There must be bats in your belfry. My legs are still stinging from the dishwater. Bernadette suddenly asks, Didn't you see anything? Marie regards her sister sidewise. She seems changed, so firm of purpose, so much older than half an hour ago. Jean asks, Why, was there anyone with you in the grotto? Bernadette curtly ends the conversation. No, no, nothing at all. But before this day ends, she recognized something had happened to her. Her life from that moment on changed, never to be the same. At first her miraculous visions were scoffed at. But in 1858, a holy spring appeared at the grotto where Bernadette had seen the Virgin Mary. Soon pilgrims, the dying, the cripples, the spiritually tormented, and the faithful began streaming to Lourdes to bathe in the waters, praying for and often receiving miraculous recovery. In 1865, French leadership is now under Napoleon III. He has championed the local government's efforts to hold back the deluge of humanity coming to the grotto. These pilgrims have tormented the intellectual fervor of France's modern men with their tales of an apparition. Also a consideration for Napoleon III is the delicate balance of power he has struggled to maintain in his rule over France. Besides, he had grand ambitions to expand his territory and reign. But Napoleon III has a young son who is a delicate child. Frequent reoccurrences of fever keep everyone on edge with the boy. Does the youth have scarlet fever, or is it just a croup? His wife, Empress Eugene, fawns over the two-year-old boy, and he is under the royal doctor's constant attention. They are at their wits' ends as to what can be done for the child. A nursemaid tells Eugene of the miracles occurring at Lourdes. In desperation, Eugene begs Napoleon III to allow her to send the child's governess, a trusted friend, on a mission to gather some of the precious water from the grotto at Lourdes. But Napoleon III is in a precarious position, as the government, with his consent, had decided to close off the grotto in Lourdes. As one of the French government's local bureaucrats said, quote, We servants of the government of this town have been for many months engaged in a struggle against one of the maddest oddities of the century. We are carrying on the struggle at the behest of the imperial government and with full knowledge and consent of Napoleon III, all because of the hallucinations of a feeble-minded female and rumors of alleged cures. They forge a weapon against the regime and Napoleon III. But how can Napoleon III turn a blind eye on his son and pacify his fretful wife? He defers to his trusted doctor, who perhaps indulges the request, and says there would be no harm in the boy drinking the water. So Madame Brau, wife of the former Minister of the Navy, Admiral Brau, goes on to Lourdes to collect the water. Once she has succeeded in her mission to obtain the water, she gets arrested and finds herself before the local magistrate. Madame Brau is ordered to pay a five-franc fine, which she does, and to return the bottle of spring water, which she refuses to do. May I ask who the person of such high privilege you are obtaining this bottle for, the magistrate inquires? Her Majesty Empress Eugene, Madame Brau embellishes. In exasperation, the local magistrate let her keep the bottle. After he drinks this water from the grotto in Lourdes, the young son of Napoleon III is cured from the high fever. Though both the doctor and Napoleon III are quick to credit coincidence, 
Empress Eugene sees it as a miracle and asks Napoleon III to make a public proclamation and acknowledge the Madonna's curing waters. But as his government's official position has taken a stand against the young girl and closed access to the grotto, Napoleon III rejects the request outright. Amazed at her husband's callousness towards this cure for his son's illness and lack of faith in the Almighty, she determines to shame the head of France over this. But before long, he does relent. To the surprise and chagrin of his entire cabinet, ministry, and public servants, Napoleon III sends a telegram to the local officials with a short official note that read, quote, Access to the grotto west of Lourdes is to be immediately granted to the public, unquote, Napoleon III. This proclamation sets in motion the long road to reestablish Bernadette's credibility. In 1860, her claims of visitations by the Madonna are culminated in an official recognition by the local bishop of her witnessing the appearance of the Madonna in Lourdes, France. The declaration stated that the Virgin Mary did indeed appear to Bernadette Savoyon. The central theme of the Madonna's messages to humanity, turn away from deadly sin or undergo terrible suffering. Chapter 19 Our Lady of the Rosary, Fatima. Wars and tribulations would occur if mankind did not recognize the wrong in the choices so many had been making. During her apparitions, it appears that the Madonna coached her seers in logic-defying ways, directing the seers to tell the people to regain the power of prayer and faith for guidance. With prayer and faith, they could avoid the pain of distrust, violence, and and hate. On May 12, 1914, six weeks before the start of the very first World War, 22 Ukrainians are at work in the field near their church in the village of Rezhnev, Ukraine, all witnessed an apparition of the Madonna. She told them, there will be a war. Russia will become a godless country, and Ukraine as a nation will suffer terribly. Just six weeks later, the spark that ignited World War I took place with the assassination of the Archduke of the powerful Austro-Hungarian Empire. The shooting took place in the Bosnian-Herzegovina region before it became part of Yugoslavia. This international war would take its toll, costing an estimated 10 million lives. In Rome, during World War I, Pope Benedict XV asked all Christians to unite in a prayer for peace. Quote, To Mary... Mother of mercy and omnipotent by grace, let loving and devout appeal go up from every corner of the earth. From the book The Final Hour Like France, the Republic of Portugal had seized church property and exiled hundreds of priests, including the Cardinal Patriarch of Lisbon. Secular organizations began serious campaigns against the local churches. Not since the French Revolution had a European government made such determined efforts to stamp out religious institutions, noted one scholar. One year after the Hrezhnev Ukraine apparition, chaos from the spread of the war had increased in Europe. Portugal began preparations to join World War I when the Queen of Peace chose Fatima, a little hamlet in Portugal, to bring her message of love to the divided world. A seven-year-old shepherdess, Lucia de Santos, sees an angel in the sky as she begins her practice of praying her rosary. It was in the air above the trees, Lucia recalled. It looked like a statue made of snow or a person wrapped in a sheet. A year later, the angel appeared again, this time while Lucia and her two younger cousins, Francisco and Yaquinta Marto, were tossing rocks into the valley. As it drew closer, we were able to distinguish its features, said Lucia. It was a young man about 14 or 15 years old, whiter than snow, transparent as crystal when the sun shines through it, and of great beauty. As he drew nearer, we could distinguish his features more and more clearly. We were surprised, absorbed, and struck dumb with amazement. On reaching us, he said, Do not be afraid. 
I am an angel of peace. Pray with me. So forceful was the presence of God that it almost annihilated us. It seemed to deprive us even of the use of our bodily senses for a considerable length of time. The angel came twice more. Pray, said the angel. Pray a great deal. The hearts of Jesus and Mary have merciful designs on you. Offer prayers and sacrifices continually to the Most High. Make everything you do a sacrifice. And the prayer? My God, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love you. I beg pardon of you for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not hope, and do not love you. The angel, as Lucia said, disappeared into the immense distance of the firmament. Eight days later, May 13, 1917, after this appeal, the three little shepherds, Lucia is now ten, Yaquinta is seven, and Francisco nine, are at the exact spot where the angel had appeared, but they see a different apparition. One Sunday after church, the three cousins take their sheep to the place known as Corva de Ira. They eat, then pray, as they had not forgotten the angel's urgent request. As it came to be each time before the Madonna would appear, a sudden flash of lightning struck. Afraid at first, the children began to gather up their sheep, and a second flash stopped them in their tracks. They looked at an oak tree and spotted a lady brighter than the sun. Well, this is Nico Steves. I hope you enjoyed this installment. My new book, The Very Fine Light, is available on Amazon.com. Please feel free to contact me at nicosteves.com. That's N-I-K-O-S Steves, S-T-E-V-E-S, dot com. If you like this episode and for more, share them with friends and consider William J. Walsh's book, Heaven's Bright Queen, Apparitions and Shrines of Heaven's Bright Queen. This is Nico Steves. Thank you. See you next time.